Today, we're going to be looking at an anti-positional masterpiece played by Bobby Fischer. You heard me right. Anti-positional. This game is just magnificent. I mean, from him creating a novelty on move 15 to him absolutely dismantling Max Oive. I thought it was Max U, but apparently it's Max Oive. I'm trying to be respectful. It's good to pronounce people's names right, or at least attempt to. He beat Alakine in the World Championship match, Ali Ekin. Uh, he won every Dutch championship he entered in a time span of 30 years, so he was no scrub, and Fisher absolutely dismantled him. It is going to be a Karakon, it is going to be a Panov attack. This was the meta back then, and then Fisher creates a novelty on move 15. So let's get into it. Of course, we get pawn c6, the Karakon, pawn d5. By the way, this game was... In the chess Olympiad in 1960, played in Germany, there's the background. Not sure which round it was. E takes d5, c takes d5, pawn c4. This is, in essence, the pan of attack. This is the meta. This is what was believed to be the best. We get four knights in the center of the board, as they do best, and bishop to g4. So how is this game going to get interesting? C takes d5, knight takes d5, blockading the isolated pawn, queen b3. Okay. Okay, I can see how this gets interesting. Queen b3, we're aiming at b7. We have, we're aiming at d5 two times. This guy's hanging. What's going on? That pawn's isolated. Whoa, okay. This is getting complicated pretty quickly. Bishop takes f3. G takes f3. Also, bishops capture backwards, so don't take the knight. That's not what I was going to say, though. What I was going to say, though, is the Karakon used to be my least favorite opening to play against. Now it's my favorite opening to play against. So you get bullied enough times, you fix what's wrong, and then you're like, ha, what now? E6, queen takes b7. So the reason black elected to chuck the pawn is if he tries to hold on to it, it's possible, it's a line, but don't go pawn grabbing them. Then you get greedy, bad things happen in life, in chess, everywhere. Rook to d1, you're going to win material, you're going to win the game. So don't do that. So he chucks the b7 pawn. Typically, it's a poison pawn. Let's see what happens here. So we're aiming at c6. That looks pretty strong. Queen can't move up because they lose their rook. So what are they going to do? Okay, they take the isolated pawn. Look at this. Double isolated pawns and an isolated pawn. That's a lot of bad pawn structure. Black's pawn structure is perfect. So where's the imbalance? Where does it stem from? Okay, bishop to b5 looks like a very good move, and it is. Knight takes b5. How do you play this position? What does white play? You might be thinking queen b5 check, but that is an inaccuracy. I don't know. That was a weird stutter. That is an inaccuracy. You want to misplace your opponent's pieces. Okay, look at this position, right? Look at this position. And then look at this position, right? Taking away queen d7 because you win the rook, forcing king e7. And now that look at the difference. That is a massive, massive difference. At least for a person to play. The position looks awkward now. The dark squared bishop cannot move. That will be a theme throughout. Knight takes. Pawn takes. Queen d7. The meta. And now we get the novelty. Up until here, c4 was like the only move played. I think a4 was a move as well. But we get rook b1. The best move as well. This move doesn't look like much at face value on the surface. But the idea is extremely deep. And look at how much better he understood the idea than Oive. You, Oive. Oive. Rook to d8. This is what he chooses to do. It's one way to play it. We get bishop to e3. And now a queen trade. So I didn't want to talk about it in the reverse order because most of the time it would transpose. What now? Well, why just threatening to take the pawn? So black defends it. Makes sense. King to e2. So your pawn structure is very bad, but what do you have? You have activity, and you have your opponent, in in essence, in a box. So, funny enough, Ivanchuk and MVL had a game in 2017, I could not believe this, where MVL played the move, MVL, first of all, played into this line. I don't know why you would ever do that. But second of all, he played G6 here. This is bad because Bishop C5, he went King F6, and he just lost the game. I don't know the background of the game, but that's crazy. I mean, if you had you reviewed this game, you would have beaten a 2800. How do you like that? And they cannot go king e8 for reasons that are similar in the game. Right, check. Here, rook hb1. Oh no, I blundered. Oh no, I didn't. 
because you pick up the rook. So back rank issues. That is a motif in this game. So here we don't get g6. We get f6. He pushed a different pawn. So it's a different game now. Rook to d1. This is a very good move. Right? Which pieces of black suck? The bishop, the rook. Which pieces of blacks are good? This rook. So get rid of the only good rook. And you have good pieces then. And they have bad pieces. So does the structure really matter? You know what this game made me realize? Knights can take care of poor structures, at least double isolated pawns, more than any other piece. You, you add knights to this position, I'm not so sure white has all the activity in the world. And you put a knight there, you put a knight there, those are frozen pawns. So knights would change the dynamic of this position. I think it's just because it's bishops and rooks in this end game that this is possible. So just a deep understanding by him. Rook takes, king takes, king d7. Okay, black is going to untangle. He's getting his king out. His bishop and rook are going to come out. At the end of the day, look at this pawn mass. That is sturdy. So what should white do now? Many of you might be tempted to go rook b7. And it's not a bad move, but look for a better one. Rook to b8. Why is this better? Because you're freezing his pieces. End games are all about activity. The more active your pieces, the more tied down your opponents. That matters way more than piece count. And even here, structure. So we get king c6, now we take the pawn, and pawn g5. Okay, he's going to go bishop g7, his pieces are getting out, untangling, a4. That is a queen, to b, maybe. Interesting. Bishop g7, don't trade rooks, that could easily be drawn, because the pawn could be stopped, right? You have no control over the light squares, so that's too risky. Give a check, where does the king go? If it goes here, it loses a pawn. He goes here it loses a bishop pick your poison he goes king to d5 centralizing his king it is an end game so not bad rook b7 clinical gaining a tempo on the dark squared bishop bishop moves and look at this i mean imagine being a world champion and having this done to you in the meta of the caro Khan, the pan of attack this is what everybody played amazing bishop g7 again Decline the rook trade, check, and out of all of that, our pawn is one step further. But you know how important a tempo is in the end game. So pawn f5, okay, the bishop is about to be activated. It's always like this game is literally the epitome of being one move away from not only equalizing, from taking control of the game because you have the better structure, but he just never got out. Okay, bishop to b8, gangster. Explain this move. To yourself, obviously. Pause the video. Why is bishop e8 played? It's not to get the bishop anywhere. It's actually to cut off the rook's vision from a8. So let me explain. If bishop takes pawn, pawn a6, it looks like black is in time. But he's just not. He's just always one move too slow. So bishop to b8 is an amazing move. Absolutely amazing move. And now he goes rook c8. So what black had to do was he had to go rook d8, and then if king c2, then rook c8. So then this would come with check, and you could get behind the pawn. And if the king steps on b2, there's a discovery, right? You semi, you semi see what I'm getting at, right? I hope. In essence, and, and then if he went this way, bishop takes rook d2, he gets behind the pawn. So it's because of the checks that it would work because of the king placement. It always is the relation between the kings. But okay, he went rook c8. Hard to argue. Two pieces aiming at the pawn. Pawn a6. Rook takes c3. And a blunder. So, your guys' job, comment down below. Why is rook b5 not the best move? And what is the best move? Try to find the winning line in this position. You could say you found a line. Fisher did not. That's a pretty good feeling. So, comment down below. Rook to b5 check. King to c4, he opts to go. And now rook to b7. I mean, all this back and forth, but it does so much. Bishop to d4. Now, pause the video, find the win. This time, Fisher did find the win. The answer is rook c7 check. King moves. Rook takes rook. The bishop cannot take because you promote. And king takes. How would you win this position? I hope none of you said a7. Because then you need to win the game again. You don't want to have to win the game 
again, I mean, it's chess. Anything could happen. This is very hard. I mean, you trade off a pawn, you undouble them, you have two. Luckily, the pawn's on the right side because the promotion square is dark square. But, I mean, why put yourself through this? Why not just go bishop to e5? Pinning the bishop so it's not actually guarding a7. It's pinned to the king. So the bishop has to take. And the pawn promotes. So after bishop e5, Oive resigned. I wonder what he felt like after losing this game. Probably not good. Can't imagine. But this was a masterpiece. I really like this game. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys, as always, for your time. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.